to get us started so that we have as much time as we can with Dr. Perlman. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christina Mangurian. I'm the Vice Chair for Diversity in the Department of Psychiatry. And I'm based here at uh, Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And I welcome you to our San Francisco General Hospital based um, Evelyn Lee um, Lectureship, um, Visiting Scholar Lectureship in Cultural Competence and Diversity. And I wanted to start to kind of actually, before I introduce the speaker, to have somebody who knows, um, the, the, who knew Dr. Lee, um, come and give a few words. So um, I'm having uh, Dr. Francis Liu, who some of you may know is a, a grandfather within cultural psychiatry and worked here at this hospital for many, many years. And I'm just so delighted for him to be here and speak a little bit about Evelyn. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Francis Liu. I, I worked at this hospital from 1977 until 2009, 32 years on uh, the inpatient services and um, I was very touched when um, you've asked me to just come back and say a few words about uh, my uh, colleague Evelyn Lee. Um, Evelyn was born in 1944 in Macau, China, and came here to the United States, eventually earning a doctorate degree in mental health administration at the University of Massachusetts in 1983. I first met Evelyn in 1980 at the APA annual meeting in San Francisco, and I was immediately struck by her enthusiasm for Asian mental health. And I said, we just must recruit her here for San Francisco General Hospital. And I was successful in doing that. In 1982, she came as the program director of our Asian Focus Inpatient Unit, which I started in 1980. Uh, she helped to develop our, our programs here. Um, and. Uh, in 1988, she founded the first Chinese Family Alliance uh, for the Mentally Ill, and in 1992, helped uh, develop the NICOS Chinese Health Coalition here in San Francisco. Uh, in 1990, she left San Francisco General Hospital to become the executive director of the Richmond Area Multi Services Clinic, which is a nonprofit community-based organization in the Richmond part of the city focusing on Asian and Russian patients. Um, she did publish uh, several publications and articles. Uh, she has a book which you can go on Amazon and get on um, Asian American mental health, which, which I think is still a very valuable resource. Um, and she was a real pioneer in Asian American mental health. And so I'd like to just end uh, with, uh, which, uh, with this little story, is that um, she passed away suddenly at age 59 from a heart attack. And it blew everybody away. 600 people came to the memorial service. And I was asked to make a few words about her. And this is a kind of a low resolution picture of her, but it, in a funny sort of way, it conveys her spirit still. Um, and at that memorial service, uh, of course, I thought of films and how could films be healing for us. So I thought of the very last scene of the Joy Luck Club when a, a young Chinese-American woman comes to Shanghai to tell her, her, um, her stepsisters that her that mother was dead and she had to break the bad news. And then she thought, well, um, uh, this is a very sad occasion, but as it turns out, family came together and she said to herself, there is still something I can do for Emily. I can finally meet her expectations. And so, um, with that in mind, this uh, lectureship was created to um, bring forward the memory of Evelyn Lee. So I very much appreciate um, your being here today and continuing this uh, legacy of her work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, yeah, no, Evelyn is just, I, I didn't have the pleasure of getting to meet her, but she was just a remarkable 
human being and inspiring um, and push the boundaries to make um, life better um, for the people that she was serving, just like actually uh, the women that we're going to get to meet today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Beth Hellman. Um, she's had a really remarkable career path. Um, so she was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Then she got her BA in electrical engineering at Duke. Um, and then actually um, served in the military. She was in the US Air Force, um, where she served as a space operations officer and orbital analyst. I had to look up what that was. It sounded pretty cool, um, actually. And then she left the military, came back, and then got a master's in history from Penn then followed that up with actually a, um, a law degree and a PhD from uh, Yale. So she's a highly educated uh, individual um, who has really done um, some fantastic uh, research and work in her career. Uh, she's done a lot of uh, work on sexual violence in the military and actually served as a chair on a congressional um, panel uh, looking to make recommendations about sexual assault in the military. She's got a bunch of awards, written extensively, and served as professor at Rutgers and Yale and actually in the US Air Force Academy. Um, and she was also most recently um, a former provost and academic dean at UC Hastings School of Law. And now is the president, since um, to July 2006, has been the president of Mills College here in the Bay Area. So um, what's so interesting, and I, I mentioned this in uh, Dr. Hillman's talk, because she, she's giving a bunch of talks today. She's talking to Gabe Graham Rounds and Psychiatry Parnassus, then doing this and then going to the VA. And I said, um, you know, how I her first heard about her was actually on NPR. So because of her um, work in, in the military and her, her research, she actually uh, was a um, one of the people who was speaking on NPR about uh, kind of the ban on transgender individuals in the military. And I thought, you know, it would be great to have her come and talk about that. You know, we haven't had a talk within psychiatry for Evelyn Lee on transgender individuals. And then Dr. Hillman and I started talking and we were talking about her other areas of expertise and what we could talk about um, during her day. And she talked about, well, actually, I'm on a panel looking at like, sexual harassment in academia and particularly in STEM. And actually, medicine has a really <laughs> bad uh, track record in this. Um, you know, would that be interesting? I was like, yes. And then she was like, and, you know, we also have, some, you know, I also know a lot about sexual violence and sexual assault in the military. Would that be, you know, available? Yes. And so, or of interest? Yes. And so she's giving a bunch of different talks through the day. Um, and, uh, and so she's talking more about the sexual assault of the VA later, um, as I just feel like that's highly relevant to the patients that they're going to be serving there. Um, but what was also interesting about her discussion is this happened before Harvey Weinstein. Okay, so before this kind of explosion, and I guess as Dr. Hillman's kind of reframed her mind, opportunity that's arisen through this kind of uncovering of um, kind of just frank, you know, long history of um, kind of predatory behavior um, by this very powerful individual um, in the, you know, um, in, the, in a different field, but kind of bringing it home and saying for us to have an opportunity to look at ourselves look at our work that we do here um, in academia, try to figure out how we can make it a more inclusive environment. Um, and I think that you know her talk was so um, inspiring at Parnassus. I think everybody here um, made a great decision. I know how busy everybody is, uh, but she's just really uh, phenomenal, and I'm just so thankful to have her here today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hillman. Christina keeps introducing me. Um, it's going to get um, harder for me to make a good impression on this so, um, because I, I feel a little bit set up. So um, I, I want to um, thank each of you for uh, coming today to talk about a really important topic. Um, this morning, I, I decided to use some adjectives to describe the lectures today. This morning was staggering, the extent of sexual harassment in STEM. And now this, this is uh, feeble. Um, which my sister, I have a twin sister who's also an academic, she's a professor of literature, she laughed um, at the title of this uh, feeble, and I, um, I think that's an accurate way to describe the legal framework that has evolved over time um, to address sexual harassment, and I think it's a big reason that we still have the problem that we do today, because we don't have um, a robust framework to, to address this. So that's really what I'm going to focus on. Um, 
I do want to though, thank um, Dr. Liu for the comments about Dr. Evelyn Lee. Um, I'm honored to be here as part of the, that uh, visiting scholar series. I'm also sort of stunned that Dr. Mangurian managed to get me to give three different lectures <laughs> instead of one. So, which, um, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about being an orbital anal analyst later if any of you have questions about that. <laughs> Um, let me tell you a little bit about my background in terms of this particular topic so that you have a sense of where I'm coming from, and then we'll um, run through the overview that I prepared for you of the legal framework for sexual harassment, and then I'd be happy to take your questions and focus on the things of most interest to you. Um, so I, uh, I, I started in engineering largely because that's where the Air Force um, ROTC was handing out scholarships, and I ended up in the Air Force when I graduated because I was interested in um, a way to uh, pay for an education that was more expensive than I um, felt able to manage. And then I did serve as an officer in the Air Force. I went back to study history, mostly because I knew I needed a master's degree to get promoted in the military. And then I went back and taught at the Air Force Academy, which had sponsored me to study history. And then um, things changed for me in terms of my career um, aspirations and my personal life. I came out and I left um, the Air Force. and. Uh, fled to the academy to try to um, figure out what to do next, and I entered a joint JD PhD program. So I studied, um, I studied law and history together, and I decided that the court martial system in the US military deserved more historical scrutiny than it had received, and I was interested in trying to understand that. So I looked into courts martial in the post-World War II era in the United States, and I found myself studying a lot of sexual violence that I didn't necessarily intend to study because there were so many records of service members being prosecuted for sexual violence. This surprised me in part because I didn't think the military had been aggressive about prosecuting rape um, at all the points in time in its past, and so I thought, wow, there's a lot of cases here. And then I thought, these cases must represent a small part of the overall universe of sexual assault and relatedly sexual harassment because I knew that criminal prosecution didn't always happen in theaters of war or in, in uh, peacetime domestic situations around the military. So I grew interested in this. I wrote a dissertation. I ended up teaching in law schools for a while. And I, I also studied this at a time when increasingly there's concern around the gender and sexual orientation policies of the US military. So a few years ago, uh, I was asked to serve on this congressional panel to study sexual harassment in the military and sexual assault in the military. Um, that, that public attention all came about in 2013, and so there's been a big congressional response and uh, other response, <coughs> and there's been little progress um, in the military, honestly, on the uh, incidence and the prevalence of sexual assault and sexual harassment. And that reflects what we've also seen in STEM fields. So I'm going to suggest to you why these rates remain so high and why, despite quite a long time of having laws that make this kind of conduct um, illegal and actionable uh, for employers of persons who have workplaces or run universities, colleges, and schools where this happens, and um, think about ways in which we might be able to change some of that. So this is what I thought we'd talk about. First, I'll sketch sexual harassment law for you, just to make sure we have a shared understanding of it. I imagine all of you um, have um, some baseline familiarity with this. I also know that all of you have experience in workplaces where you have found more or less welcoming environments with respect to gender and racial inclusivity. So we'll talk about the laws and how they, what they have to say about that, what's uh, acceptable and what's not. We'll talk about the impact of that law, the dissonance between law and the practice, the lived experience of people on the ground, and then how we might sort of reframe this to move ahead. So this is the, uh, the law of sexual harassment is largely uh, federal because the term sexual harassment comes to us from, from interpretations of federal law. There is also the state law and um, cases that arise through state and local courts uh, because sometimes the behaviors that lead to sexual harassment claims under federal law also constitute claims um, that violate uh, state and, and local laws and also state and local regulations. So for instance, California, as you know, has a different set of laws than other states with respect to employment. All those are operative here. Uh, but our overall framework of sexual harassment does come from federal law. So the first law that was used to target uh, sexual harassment was Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So just, just to remind you of what that said, 
and I've been reminded of um, civil rights history because I'm teaching a course at Mills this semester on the history of the civil rights movement. And just as I find this an opportune time to talk about sexual harassment, it's also an opportune time to talk about the civil rights movement because of the challenges uh, that have, um, have appeared in recent months and years and also our increasing understanding of some of the limitations of the progress that was made through the civil rights movement in terms of racial and economic equity. So the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which gave us Title VII, bans discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Um, it's the discrimination on the basis of sex in Title VII that became the basis of sexual harassment claims because it became a violation of federal law for uh, an agency, uh, an organization, to discriminate on the basis of sex if, um, and if sexual harassment is included in that, if that sexual harassment uh, affected the, the employment and the opportunities because of the sex of the individual involved. So Title VII has been an important source of claims. Title IX has also been a critical source of claims. Title VII is different than Title IX because Title VII only affects employees. It creates civil liability for an employer uh, for the behavior of employees. Title IX, on the other hand, um, creates uh, civil liability for all persons. So literally the language of Title IX reminds us of how hopeful people were in 1972 when this was passed. The language of Title IX says, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity um, receiving federal assistance. So it says, no person shall, on the basis of sex, be discriminated against for any program that gets federal funds. So Title IX, which is pretty old now, right? 1972, as part of the Higher Education Amendments of 1972, set out a very grand set of aspirations for every educational program that's funded by the federal government in terms of discrimination based on sex. It says no person. That means students can't discriminate against other students. That means faculty can't discriminate and staff can't discriminate against students. It means anyone in the institution, um, according to the terms of that law, are protected from sex discrimination. So Title IX obviously wasn't fully interpreted to apply to everything that might constitute sex discrimination in higher ed. You probably most associate Title IX with athletic teams. So that was an interpretation of Title IX that actually held pretty strong um, through 2011 when the Obama administration reinterpreted Title IX in a Dear Colleague letter that it sent out to colleges and universities specifically and said Title, Title IX uh, means that you can't discriminate on the basis of sex or sexual orientation or gender identity essentially to colleges and universities and moved sexual violence into the category of things that are banned by Title IX that actually constitutes sex discrimination under Title IX. Now, Title VII could be used to target actions by employees, but student-to-student -student peer harassment, which is a part, a big part of the Title IX cases that come forward now, since 2011 in particular, those constitute a different universe of uh, behaviors that also constitute sexual harassment under the law, and they uh, were actionable after Title VII started. So, um, so Title, Title VII, around since 1964, in the 1970s, it started to be used to target sex, sex, sexual harassment as sex discrimination. Title IX, um, not used for sexual harassment um, until after 2011, and now used to target sexual harassment and sexual assault um, in colleges and universities because of that reinterpretation. Now, it's not clear what will happen going forward with Title IX because that Dear Colleague letter of the Obama administration has been rescinded by the Trump administration's Department of Education. So that's left um, those of us, and I approach this both as someone who's a student of sexual harassment and uh, sexual harassment law and best practices and as an administrator of an institution that has to comply with sexual harassment laws and uh, regulations. <laughs> I don't know what it means um, exactly that the federal government has changed its mind with respect to interpreting um, Title IX. Um, I do know that many institutions have pledged to continue to uh, pursue, uh, protect against sexual violence and pursue better practices around sexual violence, sexual assault and harassment, despite the change in federal policy. And I also think that it's very possible in the current political moment that we find ourselves in will encourage institutions to maintain a broad uh, sense of their obligations under Title IX despite the changes in explicit federal policy. But I'm also not sure, um, with my lawyer hat on, and I'm, I'm not my own lawyer, I wouldn't do that for those <laughs> or for anyone else, um, and 
uh, your friends who are lawyers would always tell you, you can't be your own attorney. But I, the lawyer in me does worry about whether or not a decision to voluntarily reinterpret what a federal law might um, imply could, could get an institution into some trouble with respect to how it applies that previous interpretation of law that is no longer valid according to the arbiters of that law, the um, executive branch of the government. So we're in a tricky place with respect to Title IX. We're also not done, and I'll, I'll move to Supreme Court opinion, opinions as we talk about this. You know, changes in the law with respect to anti-discrimination don't come from one branch of government. They really come from all three, from the executive branch in uh, measures like the 2011 Dear Colleague Letters sent from the Department of Education to colleges and universities. They come through the rescission of that letter. They come through executive pronouncements. Um, they also come through legislative change, like Title VII and like Title IX, and they come through judicial interpretations. So, for example, the um, the president, President Trump, uh, uh, some weeks ago announced a change in the transgender policy of the military. So since some point last year, there had been uh, open service permitted um, by transgender persons in the U.S. military, and uh, there had been um, there had been a change in the policy that prevented the military from discriminating against transgender persons. That changed when President Trump, or perhaps it changed, because it's not clear how fast this action could get implemented on the ground, uh, President Trump rescinded that policy, said uh, there would no longer be protection against discrimination for transgender military personnel. Um, then a week, week and a half ago, I think it's, it's a week ago yesterday, last Monday, I think, the, um, the uh, court that was hearing a challenge to that transgender, that change in the transgender policy, actually held that the president could not legally unilaterally, without any evidence, change um, the military's uh, requirement to not discriminate on the basis of transgender status of an individual. So we've had a very topsy-turvy, back-and-forth situation for our transgender military personnel, and that is likely to continue to happen under the Title IX regime, where we're not sure exactly where things will land with respect to federal regulation. Um, that overview of federal regulation, though, I wouldn't worry too much. If you care about stopping sexual harassment, I wouldn't worry too much about the federal framework changing because it's been so ineffective in addressing sexual harassment anyway. So, um, but the Supreme Court opinions are, are a piece that I should point out. I just gave you an example of a court making a change in the law that Congress and the President had both uh, weighed in on uh, with respect to transgender military service. Likewise, the courts have had an impact on sexual harassment law. So. In the, in the 1970s and then into the early 1980s, uh, persons successfully brought forward claims of sexual harassment under Title VII. They said that sexual harassment, what was normally um, a request for sexual favors that led to, uh, that a rejection of led to a dismissal, must sneeze. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, it was if somebody uh, didn't comply with a request of the supervisor or other person at work for sexual favors or um, that didn't respond positively to sexual coercion, they could be fired or they could be demoted or not promoted. Those are quid pro quo incidents of sexual uh, harassment where someone was denied uh, in a workplace opportunity because of their refusal to engage in some kind of sexual conduct that a person at work asked them to engage in. Those were recognized in the courts in successful claims of Title VII sex discrimination in the 70s and 80s. And then in 1986, we had an important Supreme Court case um, where a woman who had been employed in a bank for a long time had been subjected to um, quid pro quo sexual harassment, meaning if you don't do this, you would be fired or demoted. She actually brought a different kind of claim, a hostile work environment claim, which you all know from the sexual harassment training that you've received is the second type of sexual harassment that is recognized under Title VII. So you can't have a hostile work environment that creates an atmosphere so intimidating, degrading, um, and offensive to a person that it actually constitutes sexual harassment. And strangely enough, the case in 1986, when the Supreme Court recognized a hostile work environment case, it could well have been a quid pro quo case because it involved sexual coercion and really what we would see today as repeated sexual assaults of a bank employee by a supervisor over a period of time. And yet that, that did establish new law that said a hostile work environment um, could be sexual harassment and, and the, um, the employer could be liable for that. So the Supreme Court opinions have been important in changing the law on this. We've also had cases that recognize it can be same-sex sexual harassment and that uh, the gender harassment that happens can be, can be significant enough that it actually leads to um, a hostile work environment. Okay. 
If you have questions about the state and local pieces of this, I can talk about those too. Um, but it's really the federal uh, framework that shapes our understanding of this, and it's that federal framework that has shaped um, institutions' responses, which are part of why this legal framework is so ineffective. So what did all that law do? So we've had you know 40 plus years of, of Title IX and Title VII. Sexual harassment is not new. We all know that. You watch Mad Men or other you know, cultural representations of the past where sexual harassment is a matter of course, and you recognize that as a different era. Um, and yet, it's really not a much different era with respect to the prevalence and incidence of sexual harassment. This law has, though, enabled claims. The kinds of claims I just described to you. Some persons have gotten uh, compensation and uh, restitution through the civil claims process. That means some employers have been held liable under Title VII, and then some colleges and universities under Title IX for failing to create a, a space that's free of sex, sex uh, discrimination because there has been sexual harassment that, that occurred there. The other thing that it's done is it's spurred efforts to avoid liability. The primary regime that we have right now in sexual harassment is a regime to minimize vulnerability to suit and to negative uh, reputational uh, news to, uh, to harm and damage to institutions. Um, and it hasn't been a regime that is focused on stopping sexual harassment. So we have been good institutions, and I mean we as somebody who's um, now president of an institution, but other higher education leaders, we've been actually quite good at responding to what the courts told us we had to do to avoid liability in sexual harassment cases, which means essentially we've had to create training for employees that establish a policy, and we've had to create grievance processes uh, that, that, that could adjudicate complaints, and we've had to make clear that there's, a, there's um, a no tolerance for this kind of behavior in a workplace. So the reaction has been, understandably, I think, but not, um, not a positive one in terms of the actual problem, has been to reduce liability of institutions. The law has also, as I said, not affected the incidence of sexual harassment, nor affected reporting rates. So the incidence, I'll, I'll use some of the medical training and education numbers that I talked about at greater depth this morning. The, there's been a recent, we have 40 years of data on this now. We don't have a lot of studies because there hasn't been a lot of work that's been funded or supported, and because institutions have a counter incentive to collect information because it makes us look bad if our institution has very high rates of sexual harassment or assault. So there's, there are actually a lot of reasons we don't know more about this. But what we do know, um, uh, there's some 20 some studies that uh, were in uh, medical education and training between 1991 and 2016, and a meta-analysis of those studies showed that almost 60% of persons in medical training and education, and that was interns, residents, um, a, a large set of students experienced some sexual harassment um, during the course of their medical training. So we had um, an, uh, a, wide, a widespread problem, uh, incidents running right through 2016. So when I say little impact on incidents, uh, also on prevalence, so how widespread and how likely it is to have a new case that comes up, I want to be clear, these are not incidents that are happening, be happening before women were a significant presence in, um, in medical education. These are incidents that have continued to happen as women have made up um, a significant minority or sometimes a majority, depending on the specialty and the location, of persons in training um, in, in medical education. We still have very, very high rates. Um, and we have much higher rates for women uh, than we do for men. We also have higher rates for women who are from underrepresented racial minorities, and we have higher rates from persons whose gender identity and expression is, um, is in, from minority groups too. So there hasn't been, there really hasn't been a significant decline that we can see um, in the incidence of sexual harassment, despite these decades of laws. The reporting piece. We also haven't seen increases in reporting rates. Now, we have had some very um, uh, intrepid um, and committed individuals uh, who had the resources and the wherewithal to come forward and decided to prosecute those claims. When we say it enabled claims, it did create causes of action under the law that could be litigated and created a, um, a, a lot of, um, created some changes when individuals are, are, when individuals' institutions were held liable. But reporting has continued to be very, very low. And I just want to put out there for you, I don't think the answer is for us to convince everybody who's a target of sexual harassment to come forward and report. 
I think there are good reasons that people don't report. I think the evidence tells us they don't report because they don't think they'll be believed, because they think that they'll have bad professional outcomes as a result of reporting, because they don't want to ruin a career of someone else, even if that someone else is making their career uh, less viable, and because um, if they're paying attention to the data out there, actually, they're, they're not likely to be more successful personally or professionally after reporting. This is not 100% true, of course. There are many persons who come forward who are vindicated through the process of bringing forward a claim. But in the aggregate, it's actually very reasonable for persons, men or women, who suffer a sexual harassment incident at work to not report that and, and instead to exit the situation um, so that they can, uh, they can try to regain their professional footing elsewhere because of the consequences of bringing, bringing that claim forward. So this is the world that we have right now with respect to federal enforcement and sexual harassment law. We have the rhetoric of zero tolerance and the reality of high incidence and prevalence rates. We have training required. If we look at the numbers, there's a recent study by a Harvard sociologist uh, um, who helped to lead that, uh, Frank Dobbins, about how many corporations and universities have implemented sexual harassment training um, and grievance procedures um, in their workplaces. It's, it's nearly universal now. You know, virtually every, um, every, uh, every employer, and certainly every large employer, has these kinds of programs. Um, yet there's no proof that any of that training works. And in fact, some of it we can see now is actually detrimental. For instance, mandatory training seems to be detrimental for the uh, gender equity attitudes of persons subjected to that training. Largely because it's training like this, where I come in and talk to you, and you all sit there and listen quietly, and then file out. And, there's not much interaction, and there's not much uh, engagement by, on behalf of the people who are in the room, and there's not much learning that happens in those instances. It also tends to frame the training that we have as wrongful behavior that um, some small group of persons might do, but is not sort of ordinary behavior. And it allows each of you who are sitting in that room to believe yourselves not to be part of the problem, but instead to be the persons who shouldn't have to sit through this because you wouldn't engage in this behavior, and this isn't the kind of thing that actually should apply to you. It also um, hasn't worked um, because we didn't study whether it would work before we did it. I mean, we really have put the cart before the horse with respect to this. We don't have enough information about the kinds of training that work. Um, we know some things, some things do work, I'll talk to you about them. We don't know enough about what works yet. We know an awful lot about what doesn't. And then finally, and this is where uh, my administrator piece rather than my student of the problem um, hat sort of starts to come on. This has been a very costly implementation for many employers. No one is happy when you have to do mandatory online sexual harassment training. No one is happy when our uh, compliance costs increase because we have to buy that training from the different vendors out there as the sexual harassment prevention industry has become a genuine industry for workplaces either in higher ed and outside of higher ed. Um, and yet, there's been very little return on investment because first, if you care about solving the problem, which I think, I think most administrators do, I certainly do care about ending sexual harassment, reducing sexual harassment to the greatest extent possible. It hasn't worked to do that, and it hasn't actually really limited liability all that much in terms of reputational harm um, and uh, the continued parade of scandals that come forward. So really, we're in a bad place with respect to the law that sets out uh, this is unacceptable behavior and the reality that we've done a lot of things that don't work to try to fix it, and we have been left with a very big problem. So what should we be doing? So changes in a, a culture of a workplace are something that we do see that works. It does matter if we have behavioral norms. Um, changing people's attitudes can be difficult, and they certainly also matter. But changing workplace norms, and here we're just talking about a workplace, not the entire set of social situations that persons encounter, their family, the community that they're in, um, the, um, the, the different parts of their lives, but a workplace, which is governed by rules that an employer sets out and enforces, it seems reasonable that employers could shift the culture of requiring um, persons recognize the dignity and worth of others and not um, subject those persons to degrading comments based on race or gender. So the shift in culture is possible. It, some workplaces certainly are different with respect to this than others. As you think about your own experiences in different workplaces, you can likely identify some aspects of workplaces you've been where you feel there's a greater sense of uh, inclusivity 
and uh, belong, a sense of be belonging that's offered to a wide range of people and then other places where you don't feel that way and you could see that it was a more exclusive, maybe more hierarchical space that actually led to more expressions of, um, of sexual harassment and, and then the, the related continuum of that right into sexual assault. Um, we can also reinvent training. You know, some things do work. Uh, uh, interactive training, um, running scenarios with people, talking about inclusion and belonging rather than talking about sexual uh, harassment definitions, focusing on, um, uh, on everybody being part of the answer rather than only the persons who actually suffer the most harm as, as a target of harassment being the ones who need to come forward. Bystanders feeling empowered to actually come forward, that makes a difference. That makes a difference in sexual assault and in sexual harassment. And persons are more likely to come forward if some if they feel like others in their workplace share their attitudes. You know, being out there by yourself is a hard place to be for the person who's targeted or for the person who calls out an instance of sexual harassment. We recently had a, um, a, a study of, of astronomy where um, the reports of nearly 500 astronomers were surveyed. Astronomy is a no notoriously exclusive field that is not racially and gender diverse, especially at leadership levels. Um, they found 90% of persons had seen sexual harassment in their workplaces. 90%, I mean a tremendous number. And it also found that many women who are disproportionately likely to be targeted as, as not only women, but mostly women are targeted um, for sexual harassment. Um, one in 10 white women had actually decided not to pursue a professional opportunity because of their fear of sexual harassment. And one in five African American women had decided not to pursue an opportunity, a conference, an event, a professional opportunity because they feared sexual harassment in that place. So it has a real effect on people's opportunities and behavior. If we can reinvent the training to recognize um, that this is a norm that the workplace uh, shares and adopts, and that it's everybody's problem to address and not a small person's uh, set of problems to address, it, it, it can potentially improve things. Um, the focus on the problem and not liability. This is hard because the legal and financial incentives that lead employers to focus on liability are quite real. And so it would be a betrayal of, for instance, a board's fiduciary obligation to an institution to recommend that an institution do something that would increase its legal liability. So it could be that some legal reform can help us there, but I also think we're at a moment where we need institutional leadership to recognize that this is a problem severe enough, consequential enough, that it warrants action that is beyond the legal liability piece of this, and it's, a, it's an obligation to our workforces to do better. Um, and then finally, legal reform. We, we can do better here. I put that at the bottom of the list for good reason. I don't think that primarily the answers will be in different legal regimes. I think that the legal regime that we have does not work very well, but there are suggestions for what we could do better. For instance, um, individuals who engage in sexual harassment are not individually liable for that workplace harassment under federal law. They could be. They're liable under state law for uh, tort crimes, um, well, for crimes and then torts, essentially, so civil liability for um, for uh, uh, violating a civil law that constitutes an injury to a person that could be remedied by, by compensation, or criminal law, like battery, for instance. So there, there, is, there are possibilities on the local level to target harassers. They're rare in those cases. They're hard to, to get prosecuted and to be successful in. It could be that federal law changed to impose individual liability on persons. Individual federal civil liability for sexual harassment would change the landscape. It would mean individuals have to worry about their, their consequences. Now you know of some of the high profile cases that have been settled. We could also change the, the rules around those settlements so that the non-disclosure agreements agreements um, are not um, are not kept sealed. So, uh, and that is changing, honestly, because of individuals' behavior, right? People are coming forward and saying, notwithstanding my agreement to accept this compensation because of my injury and agree to be quiet about it and not go forward, people are deciding to, uh, to speak up despite those non-disclosure agreements that have been such a frequent part of, uh, of the settlements. I, I mean, really no attorney um, who wanted to not have a malpractice claim would actually advise a client to sign a settlement that didn't involve uh, a, a, you know, a non-disclosure agreement about that if that person had a public reputation, which generally they do. So we could change that. We could change the liability around um, non-disclosure agreements. And we may see that happening in some ways by default. We're gonna see if actually those who signed non-disclosure agreements are taken to court 
to claw back um, the settlements that they got in these instances. And a court will have to act to, um, to enforce the terms of a contract that, um, I'm not a contract law scholar, but I can think of some interesting theories that you might argue that that, that clause shouldn't be enforced in that contract. So I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in what is, I, I think, uh, shifting terrain uh, with respect to how the law is going to respond to these instances. Okay. Um, okay, now I'll put up Mills there, and I'd like to hear from you. Um, there's a lot of things we don't know about sexual harassment yet. There's a lot of things we have yet to learn, and I'm sure you have questions about some pieces of what I said or about your own experiences, and I appreciate your time in listening to me talk about how we might reframe this to move ahead at times as those both challenging and maybe has real potential for us. So thank you. Thank you so much. We have about 15 minutes. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions. Um, I, I, I might start actually because um, I'm curious. Uh, so something that's made me really proud being at UCSF because I think you um, have said that there's an opportunity right now, right, to look at these, you know, with sexual harassment or different things coming out of the executive office. Um, to uh, kind of promote our values, you know. And so UCSF, I feel like, and, and I think many people in the room would say this, you know, whenever uh, things kind of happen, whether it's um, something about transgender individuals in the military or uh, the immigration ban, there's there's a rapid response from UCSF, where from the Chancellor's office and then from uh, President Napolitano's office about this. Now, Something that when uh, Secretary DeVos sent the thing about Title IX, something that I didn't read DeVos, the statement that Napolitano made about that, I'm not sure whether you did or not, but I'm wondering, you kind of alluded to there being some risk to the university. Um, and I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Like if, if we stand by our values at UCSF, um, what, are we subject to, is there some risk? Yes, there's always risk. So, um, you know, getting out of bed, there's risk. So, um, uh, it's a great point. So, what I specifically meant is that um, if an institution decides to uh, hold it, right now the standard in Title IX cases of preponderance of the evidence for a conclusion that a perpetrator has committed um, a, a sexual harassment or sexual assault. Um, the Title IX cases are specifically around sexual assault generally, and universities have been tasked and. I'm actually not sure this is a good use of university resources because I don't think we're very expert in investigating and adjudicating sexual assault claims. And I think it's actually a very complex arena that deserves persons who understand and uh, can operate well within it. So I'm, 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 I'm not entirely sure the previous Title IX regime was the right approach to what is a very difficult problem. And yet I think the current reaction is is stepping away from a commitment to change that was a good part of the previous Title IX piece. So just to be clear, I think uh, I think not having sexual violence in a university is critical, and I think it does constitute sex discrimination. And yet, the regime set up by Title IX to address it, which involves internal adjudication by uh, persons uh, within the university, um, essentially creates another another justice system that is very hard to, to run effectively. We're not very good at justice systems on the state and federal level. They've been rife with racial discrimination and other problems. Uh, creating more of those maybe would help. I'm just not sure that that's the right one. But to your point, I think the liability for universities is if they maintain a Title IX adjudication process that uses a standard, the preponderance of the evidence, uh, rather than a higher legal standard for whether or not a sexual assault was committed, that a person who is found to have committed a sexual assault under that regime could potentially um, bring a claim against the university for following up a corrupt uh, uh, process because it didn't, uh, didn't set a high enough standard for evidence um, in, in, in reaching its decision. So, that makes sense. Anybody else have any questions? Expand a little bit more on the evidence-based interventions. Hi. Uh, okay. Uh, could you expand a little more on the evidence-based interventions? Yes. Thank yes. You. So, in other words, what do we know works? Um, so, first, I'll say we don't know enough because we haven't studied this enough. Um, uh, some places um, have implemented some changes. There are some characteristics of workplaces that don't have a high incidence of sexual assault, but we haven't funded the research to do this. Many of the researchers who study sexual assault have done this for a period of time and then have stepped away from it because 
They didn't think their professional aspirations would be fulfilled by becoming experts in sexual assault, which honestly has generally been true. They've been advised not to continue to publish in this arena. If they want to get tenure, they need to do something else in addition to this work. Also, there hasn't been funding uh, from the government, um, from institutions, from foundations to support sexual harassment research that would help us. So first, I want to say I don't think we know enough. But what we do think uh, works, um, diversity in, um, it, it seems the measures that we can see about working would be diversity in upper level management. So if you have an institution that is not, that is, uh, is more inclusive, um, it's likely to have higher representations of racial and gender diversity at more senior levels. So we have seen that increase some with voluntary training. Uh, so not mandatory, but voluntary training um, for workplaces. That seems to make them more inclusive. It's also, uh, it's also helped to have uh, mentoring, specific mentoring groups. Um, uh, so assigning persons from racial and gender minorities a mentor who can help them navigate and move ahead, that's been shown to make a difference. I know more about the things that haven't worked. Um, affinity groups seem to not create positive results because I, and I think the thesis there is that they remove people from the general mix and the culture of a workplace and they isolate them in a way that hinders their ability to make connections and continue to succeed within an institution and to move up. So it's not clear that affinity groups are a helpful intervention in the workplace. The mandatory training seems not to be helpful. In sexual assault, bystander intervention has been shown to be helpful, and in general, empowering persons and reducing the steepness of hierarchies among different levels of employees. So in STEM fields, some of the worst harassment takes place at remote field sites um, in places that are far from the constraints of others, where single individuals can be authoritarian in their leadership styles, and they get much more purchase to do things than they would if they went embedded in a larger institutional framework. Um, which is not dissimilar from a military deployment experience, actually. So I think that the hierarchies and the, um, the power differentials that operate are a big part of this. The persons most likely to be targeted for harassment are junior level persons, younger persons, uh, persons without a lot of power in a workplace. They also have the most to risk from coming forward. And yet, um, we've been in a space where we've said in workplaces, we just need more people to report. If you would just report, employers like me, employers have said, just have more people report. If we don't know about the problem, how can we fix it? And yet, there's been this counter incentive by the law where if we know about the problem, then we have to fix it. So let's not know too much about it because then we can, we're, we're going to be we're going to be obviously targets for uh, for suits that would claim we knew that this was a problem and we failed to fix it. So. We need to get away from those cycles of uh, not collecting information because it would create liability um, and, and focus more and fund more studies on what actually would work. Yeah, I'm just a little bit curious because sexual harassment is usually from women towards men. Um, in the case where a man makes a an accusation of sexual harassment. Do you think the investigation process is as intense in as if it were from a female to was a male? Just I'm just curious about that. No, it's a it's a good question. I think gender and sexual difference are on play um, or at play in all of these um, these investigations. I know more about how it works in the military than in all the different higher ed atmospheres that are out there. But in the armed forces, for instance. Um, sexual harassment of men is very prevalent, as is sexual assault, actually. The rates are much lower for men, but because of the skewed gender demographics of the military, the actual numbers of men who suffer sexual harassment and sexual assault are higher than the number of women um, in terms of absolute numbers. Um, I think in places that have established grievance procedures, there should be no difference with the energy um, and commitment with which the investigation is pursued. But I think um, men are, are even less likely than women to come forward with a charge of sexual harassment or sexual assault. And so that reporting uh, challenge is that much worse in that situation. And I think any time um, persons uh, buy into an institution, feel like they're a part of it, and, they, and then they're betrayed by that institution, it also creates a tremendous uh, consequence for the persons. And I didn't talk about the impact of sexual harassment and, and sexual assault on individuals who experience it, but it's huge. And it's especially the, the studies of military sexual trauma have made clear this is a tremendous consequence for the men who experience you know, sexual harassment and sexual assault in the military. So I haven't seen any studies that say it gets investigated in different ways, but the dynamic of reporting is clearly different for male victims of sexual assault as compared to women. Other questions? 
We're going to be um, kicked down in a few minutes. So one one question that I have is I'm wondering, you know, I'm in the Department of Psychiatry, so I want to leave a little bit of room for um, my colleague to talk about our climate committee. But I wanted to find out, is there anybody in other departments who are doing some novel things around sexual harassment or reporting that anybody would be willing to share if they if they're, feel like the department's doing something like cool in this area? This is a selfish request because I'd like to <laughs> um, mimic stuff as I'm trying to think about this. Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, uh, suggest a, a reframing. Uh, and I come from uh, an HR background, and it is critical for success that an integrated vision for the institution just start first. And then the values that accompany that are indeed um, represented in not only in just uh, what do you call this, not just uh, these previous reporting or process after the fact, because after the fact it's already done. Come on, you should start first at beliefs, then behaviors. So the beliefs of the entity or the in, or the institution should be so inspiring that it will overhaul a, um, the culture and then put it at the heart of what they call the performance management system. It should be at the heart. It cannot be, okay, just report it. No, it's, it's in incentive pay, it's in, in the pay systems. We are here to be paid to have a harm-free uh, let's say, achievement-inducing uh, environment, and that's what we pay for. You must contribute to that as a person, uh, as a student. As an employee, um, honestly, of the institution, as a, you know, as somebody who's helping it pursue it, that's well put. Thank you very much, Dr. Gilman. I heard you this morning, and I heard you today, and some of the things you said just now are new additions to what you said this morning and this has been just extraordinary. Thank you very much. And I want to follow up to let you know, for those in the Department of Psychiatry, I want to let you know that in the 1980s, in response to some visible cases that were happening in the department, um, the chair established what is called the Climate Committee where Climate Committee stands for Departmental Climate around issues of sexual harassment, gender discrimination, race, ethnic discrimination, where one of the parties involved is a faculty member. The other party can be a student or a staff member, but one of the parties needs to be a faculty member. And this is a committee that uh, is confidential, is voluntary, and can serve as a consulting a safe place, as well as an advisory role to the chair. And I want to let you know that it continues to exist since the 1980s. It was first chaired by Noel Tang, then it was Sofia Vinogradas, now I'm the chair. Melissa now is the SFGH representative. Derek uh, Sartre is at Langley Porter, and Anna Glazer is at the VA. And you can make use of this resource by here at the general by calling either me or Melissa now. So thank you very much. Thank you. And then also for those not in the department, um, you know, I think that there's also, they, they, there's tons of resources on the Office of Diversity and Outreach website on these and where to go to for help. And actually there's um, a whole group called CARE, and so you can go and look online and it's very easy to find out where to go and who are different people that you can talk to because there's different levels, right, if you want, you know, in maintaining confidentiality. So I encourage you to go look on the Office of Diversity and Outreach website because there's a ton of information there. We're gonna get kicked out of this room, um, so right, right now, so I want everybody to join me in thanking Dr. Helen Perkins.